Okay, folks, thanks for sticking around. Um, why don't we continue back on? Okay, so we left off with challenges to the thinking process. Let's pick up there, shall we? Um, so I mentioned that we've got, there's lots of challenges to the thinking process, but I wanna talk about two of them. Um, and two of them, which I think are particularly relevant to a classroom or academic setting, uh, but also a workplace setting um, and that sort of thing. And those are uh, multitasking, which, you know, humans have always had to multitask. It's not like this is a new thing, right? I mean, we're, we've evolved to be able to have an attention system, which we won't talk too much about attention uh, in this class, but we, our attention system is designed or evolved uh, to pay attention, you know, to uh, extract information from multiple sources, but we have to switch those sources uh, enable to, you know, to enable us to focus on one thing, focus on another thing, the cost of switching from one thing to the other is that it takes a little, little bit of time, right? If you're paying attention to two screens, if you're watching two screens and you've got to flip your attention back and forth, when you go from this screen to this screen, you're going to miss something because for a split second, you're not looking at any screen, right? Your eyes are moving from one to the next. And then as soon as you're over here, you're not seeing what's over here. And as soon as you're over here, you're not seeing what's over here. And so we've got a lot of competition. Um, we've all got phones, smartphones. Uh, those phones are less likely now than probably in the past uh, to make sounds, uh, notifications, but sometimes you have your notifications on for a good reason, right? I mean, sometimes you have a vibration uh, notification for some things, but not everything. And sometimes you have a sound notification for one thing, or sometimes the phone is just there and you see the notification come up, right? Uh, and so it catches your attention, right? It lights up and you look over at it. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, sometimes I'm out for a run early in the morning. I swear every single person I see driving in the morning off into a work site uh, has this glow of a screen uh, on their face while they're driving at like six o'clock in the morning in the dark. I think they're watching TikTok. Uh, I think people are watching videos while they're driving, uh, which is kind of scary. I know they are because I can see them. <laughs> if I'm on the sidewalk and you see a, a vehicle driving towards you uh, at night and you can see that the light is changing on their face uh, because it's dark out, right? And the screen is, so you can see that they're watching, they're looking up and down. Um, that's a distraction, right? I mean, we know that's a distraction. Even those of us who uh, try not to be distracted know it's a distraction, right? Even those of us who don't care know it's a distraction. Uh, I'm not picking on TikTok in particular. It's just that it's really common, right? It's a popular site for a reason. It's algorithmically driven to keep you watching more videos. The existence of COVID itself is a bit of a distraction, maybe less than it used to be, but we're still aware of it, right? I mean, we still know that there are concerns. Uh, we're still aware that, you know, from time to time, we're gonna have to worry about um, uh, being sick. Uh, for the last two or three years, I don't know about you, but it occupied a significant portion of my working memory, uh, just obsessing about it, right? Obsessing about uh, when I should get my next vaccine. And you probably remember two years ago, was it 2022, I guess, or 20, I don't know, it all kind of blurs together, right? Uh, there was a time when the, there were no vaccines and then we rushed out to get them. Uh, and that was an anxiety producing thing for a lot of us because uh, you wanted to get your vaccine, but you had to wait. Uh, or they weren't, they didn't have them here and they had them somewhere else. Or remember last year, you could get COVID rapid tests, but only at the liquor store uh, in Ontario for a brief amount of time. And so, I mean, it was kind of a, you had to think about this kind of stuff. And most of us obsessed about whether or not case counts were going up or down. That took a lot of mental resources for me, probably took a lot of mental resources for you. 
are the classes going to be canceled? Are they online? Are we back in person? Are we not in person? Uh, what are the masking rules? What are the, you know, what are the things that are going to change? What are the vaccine requirements? That's a lot of mental energy and a big distraction. So we've got external distractions and we kind of got internal distractions, just thinking about problems, thinking about what's going on in the world, thinking about what's going on in your life. So you got to multitask. And we also have to deal with incomplete evidence. Here's an example, but there's lots of examples. If you're struggling to solve a math problem or a physics problem or an algebra problem for homework, and you remember the correct algorithm or the correct example, it should be straightforward. But if you remember the wrong algorithm, the problem is going to be more difficult to solve. So a lot of times we're operating without all of the information. And I don't want to keep using COVID as an example, but that's a it's a pretty salient example we all dealt with, right? Uh, governments and public health uh, were operating with incomplete evidence as COVID was three years ago, a new disease, right? With un lots of unknowns, uh, treatments uh, that may or may not work, uh, different kinds of uh, mediation uh, strategies that may be more or less effective and a lack of resources. Um, you're operating with the best intentions, but often with incomplete evidence. And so if you're making a decision or adjusting your behavior and you're doing it without all of the information, you've got to have some strategies to deal with that. So those are two problems we're going to talk about. But I want to talk about them within the context of an academic setting. So uh, here we are uh, in a standard uh, secondary school classroom. These poor kids have to sit right next to each other it looks like they're sharing a laptop and they're all on a smartphone or a device. Now, likely in this picture, they're using their device for part of the class, right? Responding to an online quiz or a poll or something. What are the, what's the quiz that everybody does online? What are they called? Kahoot, right. They're probably doing a Kahoot, which is a, a, you know, a, a, a pretty typical way for uh, secondary school and primary school teachers especially. Uh, to get kids to use their device in a way that is instructive, right? So you're using it in a, in a productive way rather than as a distraction. But, you know, at the same time, you got two kids sharing a desk with three screens in front of them. Which screen is going to matter, right? We all have had to come up with strategies to deal with that. Most of us, but not everyone, uh, has their phone on their desk. And I'm just looking around. I see most people have their phone on their desk. And most, but not all, have it face down because that way at least you don't see notifications. But some of you have it face up and it's not a distraction. In fact, I don't, it doesn't seem like it's a big distraction at all, does it? Do you feel like your phone is a major distraction or a minor distraction? I feel like it once was a distraction, but now there's so many other things which are bigger distractions that the phone actually seems like a small distraction. And plus, most of you probably went through uh, primary school uh, and secondary school in an era when everyone else or most other students had devices as well. And so you probably learned strategies to have it not be a major distraction. Those of us that are like in our 50s uh, did not have that luxury. Uh, so we had to learn them uh, later in life. So it may or may not be a distraction. Let's talk about some ways in which smartphones can be a distraction. And then let's talk about ways in which they are not a major distraction. Uh, some earlier research, this is from 2009. Uh, and so they refer to uh, media multitaskers uh, in general. So a media multitasker is someone, and you may find yourself in this category, who self-identifies as someone who pays attention to more than one media source at a time. So this is like you're watching Game of Thrones while you're tweeting about it on your laptop as well, uh, iMessage group uh, talking about the episode uh, and maybe there's some music playing as well. So you got several different kinds of media going. This is a really common way for most of us to enjoy uh, popular mo uh, series, right? If you're binge watching something, especially if it's like a Game of Thrones type thing, which lots of other people might be watching at the same time or sports, right? Which you know that a lot of other people um, are watching. Uh, going, you know, watching the game is one thing, but if you want to see what other people's reactions are, you often have a social media account open uh, while you're watching the game and you're expressing yourselves while reading other people as they express their opinion on what's happening, right? So this is a common way to multitask, 
right? You're watching a game, you're watching a show, and you're also tweeting about it or Facebook messaging or group chat or Instagram message or whatever uh, about that show. So heavy meat, now this is 2009 before a lot of those social media classes uh, or categories rather, um, but they still were people who suggested that they like to switch between different things simultaneously versus other people who self-identify as those that pay attention to one thing at a time. I like to watch the show without a distraction, or I like to read this book without a distraction. So high and low media multitaskers. And then they asked these people, high and low media multitaskers, to engage in a task that requires some multitasking. And their question is, if you're a media multitasker, you're somebody who multitasks a lot, and the task itself involves multitasking, are you good or bad at it? So here's what they asked them to do. This is a very short term perceptual memory task. And on one single trial, here's a trial. First on the screen, you see a fixation point. This tells you where to look. So imagine you're looking at your laptop, you're looking at a computer screen, uh, nothing but a gray screen and a black uh, plus sign in the middle. That just tells you that something is gonna happen in a few uh, milliseconds. So for 200 milliseconds, uh, you get to look at this, and then you see for 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, a very fast flashing display that shows a series of blue lines and red lines on the screen in different orientations. So remember, this is only a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds. Any faster, and you wouldn't really be able to pay attention to it at all. You would just know that something happened. So it's fast enough that you can kind of see it, you can see what was there, and you can track that there's different things and you can pay attention to those different things. Then for almost the rest of the second, for 900 milliseconds, you get what's called the retention interval. You get the fixation point and nothing to look at. And then you get another screen and your job is to say um, whether or not uh, the red line was in the same positions as they were in the previous. So in other words, are you seeing the same configuration of red lines? That's already hard when you're not flashing, but imagine doing this from memory. The answer here is no, by the way, because this line is different from this line. The blue lines are distractors. In this trial, you're supposed to ignore the blue lines, pay attention to the red lines, and then tell me, is it same or different? And it's different in this case. So a sample trial has a two target six distractor array. So we've got the number of targets, and then we have the number of distractors. As the number of distractors goes up, the task gets harder. It gets harder because you have to ignore something. In other words, you have to use cognitive control and cognitive inhibition to ignore something on the screen. The more things there are to ignore, the harder it is. And that's kind of what multitasking is, right? Uh, if you've got a, if you don't have to ignore something, you can shift your attention all over the place. But if you need to not multitask and unitask, you need to ignore the distractors. So we want to know: Can people who are good at multitask, who like to multitask versus don't like to multitask, are they good at ignoring things that get in the way? The answer seems to be that high media multitaskers are less good at ignoring things because their performance declines as the number of distractors goes up. They're doing all right when there's no distractors. They're doing okay when there's two distractors, but when there's four distractors, they start to struggle. And when there's six distractors, their performance kind of tanks. Uh, so people who have a natural tendency, who self-report liking to switch back and forth between different sources of information, they like to multitask, they can't stop. They can't help themselves from multitasking because they can't ignore those distractors as easily as people who have a tendency or a habit or a natural inclination to not multitask. So in other words, your unitaskers are doing a little bit better here in this very difficult task than the multitaskers. It's as if the multitaskers are in a habit of multitasking and just can't stop doing it even when you ask them to do it, right? They just keep getting distracted by all of these blue lines that they're supposed to do, they're supposed to ignore. So this doesn't tell you much about the process of multitasking. This tells you that if you like to multitask, it can be a hard habit to break. 
it can be a hard thing to turn off. If you have a tendency to switch your attention back and forth between two things, and then suddenly you're in an environment where you need to focus for an extended period of time, or even for little short bursts of time, that can be a challenge. And you'll notice that your performance suffers a little bit. Now, nobody's lives were at risk here because they were a little bit slower or a little bit less good at being able to uh, bring their attention back. However, if you're driving to a construction site in your pickup truck early in the morning and you keep watching TikTok videos, uh, then it's a bigger issue, right? If you can't stop yourself from watching TikTok on the phone while you're driving, uh, even though you know it's dangerous and against the law, um, that might be a time to intervene <laughs> uh, and come up with strategies to not watch TikTok videos while you're driving. Um, at some point, uh, this is a paper from 2016. Uh, and in this paper, uh, Adrian Ward uh, wondered if even if people have a habit, right? So we've suggested that maybe some of us just have a habit of carrying our phone with us and looking at it. Um, habits can be hard to break. And Ward wondered if you have a habit of looking at your phone, one of the things that causes you to have a habit or keeps your habit alive are you know, the presence of stimuli, right? That's usually that sets the context. Uh, if your phone is a distractor and you see your phone, does the mere presence of the phone serve as a bit of a distractor for tasks that require you to concentrate, like an academic type of setting, like taking an exam or uh, paying attention in class or having an argument with somebody uh, or driving or anything that requires cognitive effort? Uh, if you're already in the habit to look at your phone a lot and you just see it there, does it kind of draw your attention away, um, just noticing that it's there? That's what Ward wondered. Um, and so they set up a scenario where they, they took several hundred undergraduates. Uh, and over a course of several weeks, they put them through several experiments. And in this experiment, so they had several tasks. One was called an O-SPAN task. We'll talk about that on the next slide here. Um, the O-SPAN task, well, no, I guess I'm talking about it on this slide. Uh, they put them into three different groups. Sorry, I have the slides out of order. Three different groups. One group was the other room group. And the other room group, whenever you did a cognitive task, you left your phone in the other room under the guise of, okay, we need to be in a secure environment. Uh, leave your bag, your phone, any personal belongings in this part of the lab, and then go into this small lab room to do the experiment. That seems kind of natural, right? I mean, like if you went to a psychology experiment and they said, leave your bag and your phone out here because we don't want you to be distracted uh, and so on. Then they had a pocket or bag condition in which you carried your things and you kept your phone where you normally would keep it. In many cases, uh, in a bag or a pocket. Uh, so I have my phone currently in my front pocket. Not everybody keeps their phone in their pockets. Some people keep it in a bag. Some people just carry it in their hand all the time, which is actually pretty common to just walk around with your phone in your hand, even if you're not looking at it, right? It's just like carrying a, it's like carrying anything, right? So they just said, wherever you naturally keep your phone, keep it in your pocket, your bag, whatever. Then they had a desk condition where you were told to take out your phone in the testing room, uh, face down in front of you, uh, while you're doing the task. So you might need it later. Just like most of you, I can see actually, uh, that's a standard way for many people to keep their phones, right? You have it, it's face down, it's in front of you, it's there if you need it. If there's an emergency, someone's gonna call you and it's gonna vibrate, but otherwise it's just kind of sitting there like a brick, right? So three conditions, leave it in the other room, have it on the desk in front of you in view, but face down. Uh, and in your pocket and the bag. Then uh, they gave them a series of tasks. One of these was called the automated operation span task. And the O span task is a working memory task where you have to keep track of uh, simple mathematic operations while letter string letters are presented. And then at the end of doing these simple mathematic operations, uh, you then have to recall all of the letters. So you're simultaneously completing math problems while updating a randomly generated letter sequence. So it's a working memory intensive task. You've got to do simple math, which is already, it's not that hard, but it requires thought. 
Um, and at the same time, you've got to remember letters. And your performance is based on the number of letters you get correct at the end. So it's like a working memory span task while you're doing something else, a challenging working memory span task. If you're distracted at any time, if you just happen to glance at your phone, what's going to happen? First of all, you might miss one of the uh, operations, one of the uh, arithmetic problems, or you might miss that trial's letter. Uh, and if you miss that trial's letter because you looked over at your phone for a few seconds, uh, then you're going to perform less well. So if you're distractible, if you're a distracted person, uh, if your working memory capacity is compromised by having to do something else, in this case, the something else being looking over at your phone, your performance will degrade a little bit. It might not vanish, but it'll degrade a little bit. And that's a standard finding in cognitive psychology. When you ask people to do multiple things, their performance always degrades on the target task. So in this case, you're already doing two things in the OSPAN task. And the third thing is, is the phone a distractor? Uh, then there was a task called the Raven's Standard Progressive Matrices task, uh, which is kind of a reasoning, uh, sort of a nonverbal reasoning task. And they also did a, um, a go, no go task where you had to respond or not respond uh, to a certain stimulus. Uh, Raven's progressive matrices and the O-SPAN task in particular are tasks where they predicted there to be a distractor. If anything is interfering with your performance, your performance should go down. But if it's a fairly simple vigilance task, like responding or not responding to a stimulus, a go or a no-go task, uh, having the phone there might not be as much of a distractor because the task itself doesn't require much cognitive processing. And that's kind of what they found. So for uh, working memory capacity as measured by the O-SPAN task, when the phone was in the other room, people did significantly better than when the phone was on the desk. So having the phone in the room with you, whether it was on the desk or in your pocket or bag, seemed to result in reduced performance. Not massively reduced, I should point out, 34 to about 30 and a half score items correct, uh, but a significant one nonetheless. So having the phone in the room with you, in view, resulted in less good working memory performance. And it also resulted in uh, reduced fluid intelligence by a small but significant amount. So the implication or the conclusion from Ward's result is that even if the phone isn't sending you notifications, uh, even if it's turned off and it's turned face down, just having it there seems to be a distraction. There's some problems with this research, though. Uh, one is that the research itself didn't really explain why. Uh, we don't know if people were looking at their phones. Uh, we don't know how attached they were to their phones, because you can measure that. You can measure people based on their phone attachment, uh, or what's called a nomophobia scale. In other words, nomo in this case means no, it doesn't mean no mo phone, it means no mobile. Phobia. So if somebody takes your phone away, you sort of get anxious, right? And that probably is true because your phone is a gateway to personal information, banking information, communications, discussions, chats you've had with people, messages. And you don't want somebody else looking at your private life. I mean, that's pretty normal. So if somebody takes your phone away, uh, you would feel anxious, anxiety without having it. And it's usually a connection to other things. Uh, Second, they didn't really measure whether or not uh, the phone was the dis a significant, uh, clinically significant distractor. In other words, it is a significant distractor in the sense that you remembered three fewer words. Uh, is that a meaningful difference uh, to be remembering three fewer words in this case? The answer is to try to replicate this study, which we did, by the way. Um, and it doesn't replicate. Amazingly, this is a paper that one of my students uh, published this year, um, which we started working on a few years ago, and we have several other experiments exploring this in greater detail. Uh, the work fails to replicate multiple times, uh, which might mean, uh, this is our hypothesis, by the way. And here's, you can read the paper here at this link, uh, but generally we did a pre-registered uh, design. In other words, we made the predictions up front. Uh, we uh, pre-registered the stimulus, the analysis plan, and so on. And then we attempted to replicate Ward's original study using the same methodology. Um, 
it doesn't work. And it doesn't work several times. Each time we tried to replicate this, we found no effect. Uh, in other words, uh, regardless of condition, people score in a fairly decent range on whether they put their phone on the desk, on the pocket or the bag, or they leave it in an outside room. Uh, there's very little difference between having the smartphone on or off. Uh, we did find a small but non-significant effect of in an earlier study of people whose phones were on but left outside. That's because a number of people told us they didn't like having their phone left with someone else in another room, which I could kind of understand, right? So a few people, not many, not enough to make a significant effect, said, when I was doing that task, I kind of didn't like the fact that you had my phone and it was on uh, while you were in the other room, which, you know, kind of makes sense to me. Um, we've done this several times and we've used different measures, not just the original OSPAN task, but we've done it uh, with many other measures of working memory, reasoning ability, uh, visual working memory, uh, auditory working memory, verbal working memory, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, it might just be that in Ward's original study, uh, they had a sample where they did find a small but significant effect. Uh, our hypothesis, and we write about this in the paper, by the way, uh, is that in Ward's study, university students in the uh, mid-20 teens, around 2016 would have been, 2015 would have been when the data were actually collected, or students who were a fair amount younger academically than the students we tested two years ago. They would have been students who would have been in secondary school or high school when phones were much less common and when they were usually uh, expressly forbidden. Uh, and they would have been elementary school students in a time when many students did not have a smartphone uh, or that you probably remember examples like this where the elementary school teacher would take your phone away if they saw it, right? Did that happen to any of you? Take your phone out and the teacher takes your phone away. That's so demeaning, right? I mean, that's just an awful thing to have happen. Take your phone out and look at it. And then the teacher says, I'll take that. You don't want to have somebody take your private property. So maybe people change the relationship. Individuals in the cohort that we tested seem to report that they've developed strategies now, uh, which probably weren't as well developed in the cohort of students that were tested. In other words, there wasn't anything wrong with the study that Ward carried out. They carried out a well-designed study that was properly powered uh, with enough participants uh, and good measures. But maybe at that time, those students uh, had not yet developed good strategies. Most of us have by now. As I've noticed, most of you have your phone face down and very few students look at this. And this is true for, it's true for my own kids. Uh, they've grown up in an era where smartphones are really prevalent in elementary school and high school. And it's not as much of a distraction. It can be uh, if you let it be, but most students know how to turn it off, right? And I don't mean turn the phone off. I mean, just turn off the distraction, uh, that there are other things that you can do. It's no longer a novel source of distractions like it might have been 10 years ago. So Ward's participants would have been 10, collected almost uh, eight to 10 years ago. Doesn't sound like a long time ago, but I think it's a different relationship. And that was kind of our working hypothesis. And that seems to have been borne out in three additional studies, uh, which we hope to publish this year. Anyway, so feel free to keep your phone uh, at any time. It doesn't seem to be a distraction. Uh, and the evidence seems to be on our side uh, that phones, can distract you, but they don't have to distract you. But some things do. Like for example, here is a typical university classroom, uh, certainly set in the era when uh, there was no such thing as social distancing uh, and everybody has their, this is like natural science. Uh, what's that NatSci room, the large one? Is it NatSci one or? Yeah, the really big one. This is like one of those first year psychology classes or first year biology classes where you've got 400 people in a classroom sitting next to each other with a laptop. Uh, so the question is, is a laptop a distractor? Uh, it can be, but again, it seems to be that we've developed strategies around using our laptop that make them more effective and less distracting. So I wanna talk about two or three studies. Um, here's a paper that came out again in 2014. Uh, and just like Ward's study, uh, when it was published, it re received a lot of attention in the popular media, uh, so much so that some university instructors uh, decided to 
essentially ban laptops from the classroom because their suggestion was that if you take notes on a laptop, even if there's no other social media distractions or no other internet-based distractions, that you're not taking notes as well as if you were doing them by hand. Now that may be true. There is a difference between the act of writing where you can make diagrams uh, and the act of typing things out. However, uh, it's not as robust a finding as you'd think. So Mueller and Oppenheimer uh, published a study where they said the pen is mightier than the keyboard, the advantages to longhand over laptop. And again, there's, there's nothing particularly wrong about this idea, um, but it's not as strong of an effect as they thought. Uh, so they had a much smaller group of participants. We've only got about 67 participants. And essentially they wanted to do a, a study into whether or not taking notes by typing resulted in less good performance than taking notes by writing. How many of you like to take notes by writing all the time? Some of us do. Uh, and I can notice that there are those of you that do not have laptops. How many of you prefer a laptop at all times? How many of you like a hybrid approach, which is sort of the iPad Surface Pro? Now that's really the best of both worlds, isn't it, right? And that certainly wasn't the case here in this study. Uh, if I were a university student now, I can totally imagine that that would, I would, that would seem like the best of both worlds. You've got the ability to sync across digital devices, but you can still take advantage of some longhand. There are pros and cons to each one. Everybody has usually finds a strategy that seems to work best for them. So they tried to simulate this. This is not a classroom setting. This is a simulated classroom by asking people to watch short TED Talks that they had not seen before. A TED Talk is kind of like a university lecture, right? I mean, it's short. Uh, it covers material you might be sort of semi-familiar with. It's engaging, and you're just going to be asked questions about it afterwards. To cover topics that would be interesting but not common knowledge, and they were given either uh, a notebook with a pen to write and take notes, or they were given a laptop that was disconnected from the internet, so nobody had internet distractions, no phones around, uh, you couldn't uh, you know, check up on anything on the internet. You were literally just staring at a blank Word page on your laptop or a blank page in your notebook. So that sort of gets rid of any other possible distraction. And then what they asked them was uh, for across three different studies, they measured a few things. First of all, uh, they measured what kind of notes did you take? And it turns out, and this shouldn't surprise you, that if you take notes on a laptop by typing, you generate more words. So across three different experiments, the laptop users just wrote more stuff uh, than the writers. And that's because most of us, though not all, most people type a little faster than they write uh, because you, you get good at it, right? I mean, most of us are pretty good at typing. I'm not very good at typing. I actually probably still type faster than I write, but I type very slowly. Uh, and I'm usually amazed at how fast uh, most students are able to touch type, right? You don't even have to look at the screen, right? You can just type. Uh, and it's okay if words are wrong or misspelled, but you can go back and fix them later because it's a digital file, right? So you just type fast and you write more words. They also noticed that people who use the laptop versus longhand were much more likely to take notes that were verbatim overlap with what the speaker was saying. In other words, if you're taking notes on your laptop, you would type much more likely to write verbatim overlap with what the speaker was saying. You record the words, you kind of just take dictation. As opposed to the uh, slower longhand note takers who were more likely to summarize and abstract. So, you might be able to get a whole paragraph down with two or three words, which would then serve as a prompt for you to remember the longer uh, piece of information. When you take notes by writing, you tend to put fewer words in, right? You make short little outlines and maybe draw lines uh, or maybe make uh, diagrams. And usually that serves as a memory cue to help you fill in some of the background. But you're less likely to do that when you're typing because it's just natural to type out longer sentences. So they wrote more and they recorded more accurately. That should lead you to believe that the more writing and more verbatim overlap would also result in better memory. But as you could probably guess, because I wouldn't introduce this topic otherwise, it did not. Uh, it actually resulted in less good performance. Um, for factual questions, 
pure factual recall, there's no difference. So if you're taking notes on a laptop and your job is to just remember a bucket of information, it seems to be about the same. Uh, and that's actually pretty good for a lot of first year and second year courses, isn't it? Uh, just being able to record the information and remember it. Uh, there's not a huge difference, but when they had to extrapolate and answer questions that were not directly related to what the speaker said, the people who took the longhand notes were significantly better. The implications seemed to be because they wrote less, they had to infer more. Because they wrote less, they had to fill in more gaps when they took the notes by extending their semantic network. In other words, you had to think a little bit more and you had to encode things more elaboratively. And we'll talk about elaborative encoding uh, in the third uh, lecture of this class. So on the surface, that seems pretty reasonable, but there are a few caveats to this. First of all, it's not a large effect. As you can see, it's, this is a standardized Z score, but it's just barely significant. So it's not a big effect, a small effect, with a small sample size and another set of questions where it doesn't make a difference should cause most people, including the original authors, by the way, but not all the news stories that picked it up, uh, to say this is not a strong effect. You know, take this with caution. It's interesting and it's worth looking at, but it may not be the final answer. Now, they did attempt to address this within their original study. Uh, because they noticed that people who tended to type did more dictation, more verbatim overlap. They even instructed them. They said, hey, you're going to be using a laptop. And we noticed that people using laptops tend to do verbatim. Try not to do verbatim. Try to abstract and be a little bit more uh, high level and conceptual with your note taking. And here's an intervention. Uh, and it didn't seem to make a difference. The longhand note takers still performed better in the conceptual questions. Uh, and the laptop note takers, although they were told not to take as much word for word notes. Uh, it didn't seem to make them any better. There's something about taking notes by writing, which sometimes lets you do a little better uh, in terms of being able to answer conceptual questions. Other research, which I talked briefly about in the text, but I don't have enough time to go into, suggests that it might be uh, the sensory motor uh, channel. So being able to draw diagrams, for example, helps you remember things in a slightly different way. So you have access to other forms of information. They didn't do that in this study, though. In this study, you were just taking written notes. They weren't making diagrams. They weren't drawing things. So everybody was just taking text notes, and they still found this advantage. But uh, this particular paper also has had some difficulty uh, with its replicability. In other words, when a larger sample, and this is actually from last year's preprint, but it's now been published, um, and I should have updated that, and I forgot to update it. Um, uh, this paper by Heather Urey and many other authors, as you can see, and I, I, you can link to this uh, in the actual site or in, in, in the notes, I'll, I'll send a link around. Uh, it doesn't replicate. They call this don't ditch the laptop just yet. So they did a direct replication, unlike the one that uh, my student and I carried out, uh, they did theirs in an even bigger, grander way. So for Anna, Ruiz Pardo, and I who ran the study in our lab. It's just the two of us doing it uh, with Western students. Did anybody participate in that study, by the way? Because you may have actually been psych when you were in my study. Which condition? Uh, I was, had it on my desk. You had it on your desk. Okay. So it just occurred to me that those of you that are third and fourth year students were probably students who were subjects in my experiment. Uh, did you do the O span or did you do the CBS trials, the little online games? Do you remember? Uh, not the game. Okay. Um, so if yeah, others, if, if others of you were in that same cohort, you may have been first year psychology students when we did it. But we just did it all here with Western students. We did another study uh, during the uh, darkest days of the COVID lockdown where we extended this online and collected data from participants all across North America, uh, the UK and the EU, uh, asking them to tell us that they put their phone face down in front of them or took it to a different room. We just trusted them. Um, it didn't make any difference. They still We still were able to sort of reproduce our same results. What Yuri et al. did uh, was they 
had a bunch of labs across the world try to design the exact same experiment. So they said, here are the TED Talks, here are the conditions, here are the instructions, now run this in your lab. And so everybody signed up to say, yeah, we'd like to be a part of this. Uh, we wanna run an experiment in our lab. And then they collapsed all of these things together uh, to see whether or not running the same experiment in all of these different laboratories across the world would produce uh, a replication of Mueller and Oppenheimer's original effects. And it, it sort of does and it sort of doesn't. They did replicate uh, the verbatim and number of words effect. This is called a violin plot, and it shows the original data, the actual data points, the mean and the standard deviation around it, and then the range uh, of data, so the distribution. This kind of plot gives you a lot of information on a single plot. It's much better than a single bar uh, plot. In the plots that I showed you uh, on our study, we used a bar plot, but with the individual data points plotted. Uh, this kind of gives you one step more. It gives you the distribution, the probability distribution as well. So you can see the laptop users did write more, and they did have more verbatim overlap, but when it came time to the look at their factual performance, and their conceptual performance, we didn't see any difference. What we did see, the only thing you can say uh, is that in the longhand note takers, there's a little bit more, just a little bit more uh, range at the top and bottom end. But overall, when they try to replicate this with a much larger sample size across many different institutions, they're unable to find this effect of longhand versus uh, laptop note taking. So the take home story is that whatever note taking style you've developed over the last few years, if it works, it probably works. <laughs> uh, people seem to do no different, uh, at least in an academic setting, when they're taking notes online versus when they're taking notes longhand. Most of us have preferences, though. Uh, there are advantages to taking notes online on a laptop is that you can uh, take notes directly on the PowerPoint. How many of you take notes on your laptop by typing directly on the PowerPoint? Uh, that's a common way of doing it. It's not what Mueller and Oppenheimer were asking subjects to do, right? So you're going one step further. You're putting the notes in context. You're taking a slide and you're writing some extra stuff on there. Uh, many of you have an iPad uh, or a Surface Pro where you can do a little combination. You can type things, you can write things, and then it synchronizes across devices. Most of you probably, many of you probably take the slides, drag them right into OneNote, write your notes right on top of there, and then it's available everywhere. You can go back to them. So I can see a lot of advantages, but there's a lot of advantages to writing the notes too. And if that's a strategy that, that promotes more abstraction, uh, promotes uh, a different way of accessing the information, uh, and if that seems to work for you, and also it's lighter weight. Uh, so I do take for almost every other meeting that I attend, whether it's a meeting with one of my students, a faculty meetings, department meetings, uh, anything else, for me, it tends to be written in a single notebook. Uh, so it's much more, I'm much more likely to take written notes uh, in almost every scenario than type notes, mostly because I'm a slow typist. And then I get distracted looking at my mistakes. Uh, and so for me, it doesn't work very well. They're both good strategies, and there doesn't seem to be an advantage for either one. Uh, in an academic setting, studying for a class, uh, whatever works best for you. Don't lose your notes. I mean, if you, however you can, uh, whatever seems to uh, allow you to take the notes in the way that lets you go back to them, study from them, and then be able to do well is what you want to do. Um, let's talk briefly about some uh, other uh, uses of laptops. Then, in our remaining 15 minutes, we'll talk about uh, missing information, and we should be able to finish up between 12.15 and 12.20 as planned. Does everybody still have enough stamina to make it for the next 20 to 30 minutes? Excellent. It is a long time. You'd be halfway through Avatar uh, World of Water thinking like, how long is this movie gonna go on? And here we've almost made it through the same amount of time uh, in a lecture, isn't that great? Um, so here's a study uh, from Nick Cepeda's work uh, when, uh, uh, when they were at McMaster. Uh, university, looking at how laptops can hinder performance in a classroom setting. And this you can kind of imagine. Now, this has not been yet replicated. I kind of think this study would replicate, though, and I'll show you why. Um, now, it's not a large sample size, but there's a reason for that because of the type of class. So they essentially 
took students who were enrolled in a psychology class uh, and put them in a simulated uh, psychology class. Um, so they were enrolled in a class, uh, recruited using an online portal, as you can imagine. They brought a personal laptop and they were asked uh, to uh, view a lecture and they were then gonna test, uh, be tested on information. So uh, the they were given some additional tasks, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but basically it's kind of like the setting that we're in now. It's a large room, lots of people in there. Some of them had laptops, some of them did not have laptops. But in this case, it wasn't the note taking, it was whether or not the laptop was a distractor from paying attention. Because as you know, um, in addition to being able to take notes on your laptop, you can use your laptop to uh, track how much money you've lost by investing in crypto, uh, or uh, see what other people are up to, uh, or um, you know, place bets, uh, or all sorts of other things which can be huge distractions, right? Uh, you know, if you've got money on the line, uh, you want to know what's happening, uh, or if you just can't stop, uh, you know refreshing the news during an event. Let's say somebody storms the Capitol uh, or occupies Ottawa. Uh, and there's an event that happens uh, that's really interesting and really important on a national scale. You wanna see what's happening in the news, right? So maybe in your laptop, in addition to taking notes, you got how many, how many people have more than one screen and one browser tab open that they can see on their laptop right now? So some of you probably do. If you're using uh, PowerPoint, maybe that's the only thing you can see, but if you're taking notes, uh, you maybe you have a couple of browsers open or you've got iMessage open in the corner or you have your email open or whatever, right? It's common to have other things happening. Uh, so they were given a 45 minute lecture on meteorology, uh, which was interesting, but should have been new information uh, to people. Um, for the multitasking condition, uh, 12 online tasks, and they were asked essentially to go to the internet to look something up. Uh, so as they were being given the lecture, it would be like, and I'll, I'll actually do this from time to time, I'll say, does anybody know the answer to X? And I expect you to go look, uh, to search Google, uh, or I guess now you can ask uh, chat GPT-3 uh, uh, what the answer is. You can ask somebody, you know, look up the answer to this. So finding facts. So they were specifically asked to multitask, to go online, look up a piece of simple information, uh, and then report it back. And that was supposed to mimic what people might do uh, if they're using their laptops uh, in a multitasking scenario. Uh, the other group was disconnected from the internet, so they couldn't do this. Um, and not surprisingly, the group that was asked to do something else didn't perform as well when they got their multiple choice test on the meteorology lecture they had just paid attention to. I mean, this is not, this is pretty straightforward, right? This is not a controversial finding. If you're asked to watch a lecture on meteorology and just take notes, versus if you're asked to watch a lecture on meteorology and half the time you're looking up information online, you're, you're gonna miss some stuff. And so this should not surprise anybody. What's interesting though, was the peer versus non-peer uh, setting. Some people, and let's say this is a participant, and this is a peer who's not a participant, were seated be around people who were not multitasking. In other words, they were seated around people who were paying attention. Other people who were trying to pay attention were seated by people who were asked to multitask, right? So it's as if you're sitting up here and behind you are people who can see your screen. And if you watch something interesting or funny or objectionable on your screen and someone can see it, they're gonna be distracted as well. And that's the interesting thing about this particular study. It's not unusual that the people who were asked to go online and distract themselves were distracted. What is interesting is that people who viewed multitasking, even though they weren't doing it themselves, were also similarly distracted. So that's my one piece of advice, um, is if you're using a laptop, which most of us are, uh, is to, I guess, avoid watching videos uh, if you know that it's gonna distract someone else. If you wanna distract yourself, that's, that's your own business, right? 
uh, but try not to distract others. Uh, so if you're watching uh, a video, if you're watching TikTok, if you're watching uh, your crypto uh, investments tank, I'm sorry that they're tanking, but there's no need for the rest of the class to, to see how badly they're tanking behind you. Uh, so that's the one thing that I would suggest is that if you uh, have multiple screens open uh, and if you've got YouTube playing on one side, uh, just make sure it isn't distracting anyone else. Uh, I would suggest don't have it uh, because these results suggest that it would be a distraction for yourself, but you definitely won't, don't want to distract others around you. So this one, again, I don't know that this one's been replicated. I suspect it would replicate because people were distracted, right? They were distracted by looking at something and they were distracted because the person in front of them was looking up uh, things as well. And that, you know, it's hard not to see something uh, if somebody is looking up other information. All right, I wanna talk briefly about incomplete evidence. This won't take quite as much time. I wanna talk about a single study, uh, but I also wanna put it in context. Uh, we also use our devices to solve this problem, by the way. Uh, we use our devices to keep track of things uh, because we never have all the evidence. Most of the time, we, we have incomplete partial evidence and we've evolved to deal with that appropriately. Our devices, whether it's the internet or a smartphone, allow us to have access to information we might not otherwise remember. Um, and so the question is, how do we deal with that? So do you use the internet, your phone or a device to remember things? How many of you use something to remember? I would assume most of us do, right? I mean, you have reminders, you have an online calendar. Uh, you might set up a reminder by asking Siri to remind you to put out the trash in the morning, or you might uh, set a reminder or an alarm to wake up. Uh, Google can tell you where, or Apple can tell you where you parked your car. Um, it tells me on a regular basis that my AirPods Pro are no longer with me because they're in my office, right? Uh, so if I pick my phone up now, it's going to say AirPods Pro no longer detected. Thank you. I already know this. Uh, so my phone is doing a lot of remembering for me. There's a word for that. It's called cognitive offloading. Uh, let's talk about cognitive offloading. So uh, Google or Apple can tell you what's up next. And most of us use that on a regular basis, even if we don't structure our entire lives around it. Um, it can be helpful, right? And even if you don't use a device, most of us write stuff down. I usually write things down that I need to do for the day and then check them off as I go. Um, parking locations, it can tell you where you've parked. This can be helpful because sometimes you don't remember. Uh, most of us probably do multiple things. You remember the area of the parking lot or you take a picture uh, of the section where you're parked in a lar large multi-story uh, parking structure, right? So there's lots of ways, but also Google can remember and Apple can remember where you left your car. And if you get closer to your car, it knows because it has GPS to tell you. How do you drop a class? Um, how do you add a class? Nobody knows. Nobody really knows the answer to that question because the registrar knows, right? All you need to know to drop a class is where the registrar is. Uh, and where the registrar's website is. You don't need to know the process. In fact, it would be a waste of your time because it would change every so often. The way in which add drop happens can change from year to year. All that you need to know is where to go to find it. So in this case, your memory is a pointer to point somewhere else, which is the internet, which then points you to where the correct information is. Most of us go through our daily lives not really knowing a lot of things. Uh, because what we know is where to go to find the information. How many of you, I assume the answer is more than zero, Google the same thing on a regular basis, even though you know the answer, right? Uh, I mean, it's not uncommon uh, to Google things you already know just because you sort of forgot the exact piece, right? But somebody knows out there and it's usually on the internet. Uh, so we use the internet and we use written things and our phones and our devices and all sorts of stuff to do this cognitive offloading. So I don't know how to add and drop a course, but I know where to go to tell you to find out how to add and drop a course. It's a step-by-step -step guide, right? I mean, why remember the steps when they've written them down for you? This is not working as well as it used to. So this is called cognitive offloading. Uh, and this existed long before, I mean, it's existed as long as people have existed. 
Uh, this is not something that's new to smartphones and the internet. It's just that that gives us a lot more power. Uh, we've offloaded more basic information to a small device which connects to a larger cloud. My guess is that in the next year, uh, there will be exponential gains in cognitive offloading uh, because of the exponential gains made in artificial intelligence. Um, just as a, an example, have any of you in the last year or so been notified by your bank that someone was using your card uh, incorrectly? In other words, did somebody steal your card number? Uh, this happens from time to time, uh, even if you're very careful. The way the bank knows about it uh, is through AI, right? If they detect a pattern of usage that is not typical to your pattern, you might travel all over the place, but you travel in ways that are predictable, right? You check in at a hotel or you use an air, airline. But if it detects that you've purchased three or four things in a short period of time from a retailer you've never purchased, or you've tried to send money through a service you've never used before four or five times in a row, it knows something is happening. You don't need to know. Another bank person, individual human being doesn't need to know, but the computer knows, the artificial intelligence algorithm knows. So AI knows a lot of stuff, right? It solves a lot of problems for us. And as chat GPT-3 gets more sophisticated, I suspect that those kinds of things will start to replace internet search as mechanisms, right? I mean, you can already talk to Siri pretty well. Uh, it's just gonna get better. And I'm not, wouldn't be surprised if in one year uh, we've seen really, exponential gains in our ability to use devices uh, to solve things really quickly. The only caveat to that is how many of you were on Rogers last year when it all went down? Uh, and even the weekend couldn't play in Toronto in the Rogers Center because there was no internet. I mean, can you imagine what a whole, how many of you were, did you miss that show? What I, a dis- I just got there and then you walked by me and said, that it was canceled. I mean, what a huge disappointment. You're like, all of these concerts are canceled during COVID. Finally, the weekend, hometown, Toronto, Rogers Center. What do you mean the internet means we can't have a concert? This makes no sense. Bus to take home. Nobody knew how to get anywhere. Point of sale didn't work. And of course, it's Rogers Network that was down and the Rogers Center only runs on Rogers. It's not like Bell is going to work in there. You couldn't buy anything because everybody's using tap to buy everything on their phones. And so the whole thing shut down. <laughs> oh, it was so, it was so awful. Um, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't at that show. I wasn't planning to go see the show, but I just, I know people who were, and I just remember thinking like, that's just, I would never have predicted that this is how that show was going to get canceled. So there are some, there are some caveats, right? When you put so much online, if the system breaks, it really causes a lot of problems. Uh, and so when Rogers broke uh, for a period of time last year, everything shut down uh, for a while. So cognitive offloading, why do we do it? Uh, we do it because we can, right? I mean, human beings have offloaded things for as long as we've been around. Uh, mostly it's by writing things. Uh, sometimes it's even before we can write things. In an oral tradition, you can uh, cognitively offload things by making access, or having access to the theory of mind that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. I don't need to remember this fact because I know that my friend remembers this fact. I don't need to remember, you know, somebody's birthday because I know that my wife remembers their her family's birthdays or whatever. So you know other people who know things. So, it, you know, cognitive offloading is really common. It can be social. It can be written like writing things down online or writing things down on a notebook or a piece of paper or whatever. Um, and for most of us, it can be digital. Uh, so we use cognitive offloading to remember things, but it interacts with our behaviors. Um, here's a great study. Now, this one has not been uh, reproduced, but this kind of work has been carried out. And so this is a pretty interesting and stable effect here. Uh, and this was done by Aaron Benjamin and some of his students um, at the University of Illinois. Uh, and in this study from 2016, uh, essentially, they just wanted to know when people are asked to use the internet to answer questions, does it change their behavior? In other words, do they remember things differently uh, than, when, than when they're actually asked to generate the information on their own? Uh, so their general uh, idea was that if you use the internet to find things, 
it kind of creates a habit to continue to use the internet. In other words, like the like I asked earlier, how many of you Google the same thing over and over again? Uh, most of us do. There's lots of things that we search, even though we know the answer or we know where to find it. It's just easier to search for it because we know that that's where it's stored. And once you start doing that, you kind of have a habit of continually doing it. And that's what they were interested in studying. So they suggest that the internet can be a transacted memory. Um, what does that say? Participant? I can't see that word there. Partner. That makes sense. A transactive partner. See, I don't remember because I offloaded all of my information on the slide. So I don't remember what it says. Um, the internet functions as a transactive memory partner. Just like your partner or your friends or your network or your parents or your siblings can be a transactive memory partners because you know that they know something. The internet does the same way. You know the internet knows, so you don't need to know anymore because the internet knows. And all you need to do is ask the internet. Um, rather than retain information internally, we remember where it can be accessed. And this is a beneficial thing almost entirely, right? I mean, this isn't a bad thing. The example I gave about how to drop a class, of course, it would be a, a waste of cognitive resources to know that information personally, because you only ever need it a handful of times. All you need to know is where to go to get the information. But this is a well-established uh, finding. Uh, we use digital technology as well as we use analog technology and social technology and networks to be able to remember these things. So we've got a handful of participants, a couple of different experiments here. So we got 60 undergraduates from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, that was in the first study. Um, and they were randomly assigned to one of three conditions, um, internet, memory, and baseline. The internet condition, I'll show you in the next slide, but the internet condition had to answer questions by going on the internet. Even if they knew the answer, they had to look them up on the internet. That's what we were told. So if you were asked really basic trivia questions that you know what the answer is, you still had to go through the behavior of typing in the question on the internet and asking it. Memory, which is just try to answer these trivia questions like a trivia game. And baseline, in the baseline condition, they did not participate in the first training session. So they only participate in the test, meaning what is people's natural tendency uh, when they're not given the opportunity to learn to use the internet or to learn to use uh, memory. So in phase one, only the internet and the memory group participated, not the baseline group. They were given what they were called uh, difficult trivia questions. Um, King of England during the American Revolution. These are very American centric, you can see. Uh, My Fair Lady, who became president after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. What did King John sign? These are basic sort of historical trivia questions. They were considered difficult in the sense that a prior study meant that people wouldn't get all of them correct. That doesn't mean that all of them are difficult. It just means that on average, people would not necessarily know the answer right away to these. Um, whereas they determined that some of these things were easier. Honestly, I can't tell the difference. They both seem about the same to me. They seem hard. Uh, I don't really know what an entomologist, well, they study bugs, don't they? Insects, entomologists. What's a, what's a baby goat called? Everybody should know that. What's a baby goat? It's a kid. I mean, you got to love baby goats. Um, so there's not a huge difference. The question, what they determined though through prior study is that on average, most people didn't know these. This is just a subset. And people were able to do better on these items. So there were ones that were more difficult and ones that were easier. And if you were in group one, you were just asked to answer from memory whether you knew the answer or not. So you either knew the answer and you were right, or you guessed and were wrong, or you just said, I don't know. Uh, so you just had to do everything from memory, just like a trivia test. The other group was asked to Google each one of these uh, so that they could come up with the right answer. So they actually get more information because they get to Google it, right? So they actually get the right answer each time. What's that? They were worse? No. Not necessarily worse, no. And you'll see in, this, in the final test phase, the question is um, not so much whether you're good or bad, um, but whether or not when you don't need the internet, which they determined that these are easier questions, even if you already know the answer, do you still use the internet? And so they wanna know is, does internet use here predict internet use in the future, even if on average, the baseline group who never had this first session didn't need the internet as much? So they're not hard questions. 
uh, but they're not easy questions either. Uh, so they're a little bit easier. Um, and so what we're tracking is not performance. What we're tracking is how often do you use the internet on the second set of questions? The second set of questions being a little bit easier. Uh, and the second set of questions, you were given the option. You could search the web, search Google, or not. If you knew the answer uh, from memory, you would just, it'd be faster to not Google it, right? Um, so the baseline group did nothing in that first phase. So they did not have the prior training. They were just given the easy trivia questions and they were said, you know, answer however you want from memory. If you need to look it up, go ahead and look it up. Um, and they were 65% uh, of the participants used the internet to answer those questions. So a little bit more than half of the questions were based using the internet, which is the same as the group that used memory first. In other words, your natural tendency uh, to use the internet is about the same as the group that didn't get to use the internet at all. But the group that was asked to Google first in the first phase kept that habit. In other words, even when the trivia questions were easier and a baseline group suggests you can get almost half of them without having to search them at all, uh, you still tended to search for things. And so their conclusion was that using the internet in the past to look things up predicts future internet use. In a follow-up study, and this will be the last one that we cover, uh, they looked at the amount of effort that it took to actually use the internet. Because I don't know about you, but it's easier to search sometimes if you're sitting at a desk with your laptop than it is if you have uh, your phone, unless you ask Siri, right? Uh, so if you have your phone and you have to like do this, uh, you know, with, well, some people can use two thumbs on their phone, but I have to sort of do it you know, boomer style with one finger at a time, it takes me longer. So I'm less likely. And what usually happens is I just press and hold or ask Siri and I just talk to my phone. I mean, this is a faster and easier way to do it. This study was done prior to that uh, kind of internet access. So they basically said, if it takes more effort, are you still gonna search the web? So they had three conditions. One is you're doing everything sitting at the desk with a computer, just like most of you would be now. And if given the choice, it's really easy because you're just, you're sitting right there, right? Why wouldn't you search Google? Because you got your laptop open in front of you. And the likelihood of conducting a Google search, oops, sorry, did I step on your foot? Okay, sorry about that. Um, the likelihood of using a Google search is fairly high when you're sitting there. It decreases when you have to uh, get up from a couch that you're sitting on or a sofa and walk over to a computer. Not surprisingly, because it's more effort. People are even less likely uh, to search the internet when they have to get up from a couch and then go over to an iPod touch, which is like, you don't even want to touch it because it's so small and hard to use, right? So you really have to need to search the web uh, in order to put up with using an internet uh, over an iPod touch, right? It means that you really got to have, you, you really want to make an effort. Uh, and so what they were suggesting is the easier it is to search the web, the more likely we are to do it. And that's why I predict that we'll see a real shift over the next year, starting last year and into 2024, in terms of how we interact with artificial intelligence, uh, because it gets easier and easier, right? It's easier to ask your phone to do things. Uh, how many of you drive with a car that's hooked up to Apple CarPlay or Google CarPlay, where you can just... Uh, Tell your phone what to do while you're driving, right? You no longer have to look at the phone. Um, it can do things for you. It can make appointments for you. It can make calls for you. It can send messages. The, more, the less effort you have to put in, the more likely you are. Is that good or bad? How many of you think that's a good thing? How many of you think that's a bad thing? How many of you don't know? I mean, I don't know. I think it's a good thing to be able to uh, use artificial intelligence beneficially uh, to solve problems, but there are some caveats and some potential downsides, and that is what happens when there's an outage, right? What happens when everything is built uh, around an online system? And of course, it suggests that the companies that provide these services, it's in their benefit to keep you online as much as possible, right? Meta and Twitter and the others want you to stay online as much as possible, uh, because eventually that's going to be how products are sold to you, right? So the more you depend on that, 
the habit that you've built up, uh, the more likely you are to continue to go back to it. And the easier it gets, and I don't think Benjamin et al. Uh, thought about it in the, well, I know they didn't think about it in those contexts because uh, that scenario wasn't present in 2015 and 2014 when these data were collected. Uh, the scenario in which there are several large companies whose job it is to keep you online as much as possible, uh, strengthen the habit, but also reduce the, the barriers and the uh, effort put forward to use their system to think for you, to offload as much as possible. It can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, but either way, it's a thing, right? It's a thing that we'll all have to sort of deal with in the next year or so. Uh, more and more things will continue to shift online. But Storm at our Aaron Benjamin's uh, lab suggests that it, the underpinning is there, right? The, the tendency or the habit to cognitively offload is something that's been present for a while. And the easier it is, the more likely we are to do it. Okay, right on time, it's 1220. I can't believe it, I thought it was gonna go late. Uh, so just as a summary from this class, the take home message, and I'll try to finish every class with a take home message. What is thinking and how does it relate to cognition in general? So know about mental representations and know about the Gestalt approach and the cognitive approach. Uh, know about the definition of thinking versus other kinds of mental processes. You should definitely know about the challenges. I'll definitely ask questions on the midterm about and on the quizzes about some of these specific experiments that we spent a lot of time uh, talking about. Common question in a class is, um, you know, how much of this should I know? If I talk about a specific experiment for an extended period of time, like we did today, um, even if those don't appear exactly in that form in the textbook, and not all of them will because some of them just were published, you should definitely know about those things because I'll ask questions about them for sure. Uh, so I will ask about the multitasking study and the phone study. Yes. Uh, in what format do you usually ask about these studies? Do you ask the authors do concept wise the study? Group? It's almost always concept wise. So in terms of knowing the 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 um, the memory cues, authors and dates, uh, often that'll be the question. So in a study by Aaron Benjamin on uh, cognitive offloading, then I'll ask the question. So that's much more likely. There might be a few cases where I might say, uh, which philosopher is most closely associated with family resemblance theory? And you pick a multiple choice question. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's gonna be uh, conceptual questions, yeah. That's more about the task or the finding. Both. There are, so if you didn't hear the question, the question was, do I ask more about the task or more about the findings? Uh, and I would say that both are important. I do ask questions about methodology uh, from time to time. I will ask questions about uh, the conditions, for example, or the task that subjects were asked to do. I might also, probably a little bit more common, but almost the same, uh, ask about the findings or the results in some of these studies. Also, last piece of advice, Sometimes the question asks about, especially when it's these kind of studies in this particular class, class number one, sometimes I'll ask about the original study and sometimes I'll ask about the replication study. Make sure to keep those things straight because sometimes the results aren't the same. Uh, so if I present a study and then I present a replication study, I might ask about one or the other or both. Uh, and so it's always a good idea to keep them straight. Um, because science evolves, right? I mean, the, the, the knowledge might be updated. Some of the stuff that's in the textbook on these topics may have been eclipsed by failed replication studies. And that's not true just of my textbook. That's true of all psychology textbooks, right? As the knowledge changes, that's why new editions come out. So try to keep those things straight as well. Also know about the theories in the thinking process. And next week, if you have a chance, pre-read or at least skim through the section, the chapter on similarity, and we'll talk about how similarity underlies all of these other complex cognitive behaviors. Okay, perfect timing. See you all next week.